It's June 25th, 2018. You're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 95. Got uh, some stuff to talk about today. Electronic skin, learning skills and mixed reality and robot surveys or surveys about robots. One of the two. We'll figure it out all on today's show. You're listening to Human Factors Cast. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. You know, the intro always, it's its like, it's my favorite part of the show to do every week because I'm trying to switch it up and everything. Hey guys, welcome to Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Always bring us a fresh intro, Nick. I love it. Yes, I love it too. Man, Blake, so <laughs> in our personal lives, we have been, or, or I guess in our working lives, we've been pretty busy bees over the last week. It's been, it's been a lot of stuff, uh, but we are here. To take a break from all that, we're here to talk human factors, take a break from the politics of the world, from the stresses of the job, and we're here to talk human factors and exciting human factors contenty stuff. I'm I'm excited. Are you? <laughs> Mastermind of content. Yeah, it's going to be good. we got some good stuff coming up this, this show. A lot of like uh, mixed reality and, of course, a little bit of scary robot stuff. But yeah, are you excited? I, I am excited. I will say, though, to anyone listening, we are going to have a shorter episode tonight. I know. I'm sorry. Um, but just know that we do have some things cooking behind the scenes. We uh, l- let, me, let me say we have a, a new addition to the Human Factors cast family um, and f- what role they play and exactly why they're here. We'll we'll figure that out a little later. They're not on air. Let me say that much. Uh, that's uh, is that a cryptic tease or what, Blake? Yeah, like how is anybody supposed to know what that means? It's very ominous, Nick. No one will know, and we're not even we're not even posting their job title on LinkedIn. We don't want any surprises yet. Uh, but we do have some things cooking in the works, which is why this is going to be a little shorter episode. But Blake, we are here to talk about human factor stuff. I want to know what's going on with you. Oh, man. So, Nick, I decided that it was a good idea to try out and play Quake Champions over the weekend because I think they're they're gearing up to, like, release another, another like, rollout of it. So they've got it in beta right now. Um, but I forgot how hard it is to switch bet- from a controller, so, like, an Xbox controller, which I'm typically used to playing on when I'm playing video games, to going back to the keyboard and mouse. And just it proved to me just how uncoordinated and how short of a time it takes for me to go from you know being being all right like knowing how to kind of move around a map with uh, mouse and keyboard to just not really knowing what i'm doing and be going backwards the whole time see for me it's always the other way i always feel i guess more comfortable with keyboard and mouse um you know i i like using the controller just fine uh i i've never played quake champions what what is that for our listeners who don't know what that is and um yeah, it's just like basically it's just a variant off of Quake. So if anybody's ever heard of Quake, it's just a mu- giant like first person shooter. So really, really kind of wacky maps, lots of lots of like flying around and jumping throughout space. But it's basically just a bit a giant first person shooter. And it's like more known for not kind of like not so much like the team deathmatch type stuff, but like 2v2 or 1v1 play. Um so it's it's a little more intense, but yeah, it's just like a game I used to play a long time ago when it came out, like in the '90s, like Quake One. And this is I don't know the fifth installment of Quake or something like that. Oh, okay, yeah, I whenever I play first person shooters, I always am kind of comfortable with the with the WASD keyboard and mouse uh, orientation. I don't know. Uh, it's interesting that you're you're finding it um, like that. Your muscle memory is kind of catching up with you when when you switch back and forth. Um, yeah, yeah I'm just not nearly as comfortable as I am with like the the full having full access to everything feeling like it's really close to you in two hands versus for some reason I think I get stuck in the fact that my hands are really disparate or they're separated and I'm not not like because there's there's different functions they roll in right where you have to like toggle through through weapons or use special abilities with stuff on the keyboard and I think I'm just not used to it Man, well, I, I got to tell you, speaking of games, I guess both of our things are game-related. We didn't plan it this way, but it just, it just so happens to be. Have you heard of this thing called the Nyko Charge Block? No, what is this? So the Nyko Charge Block, so Nyko is a company that makes video game peripherals. 
Um, so Nyko has created this block. And if you're listening to the show right now, I highly encourage you to go look at this thing in action. Um, but I will try to describe it the best I can. So basically what it is, is it's a little docking mechanism for your controller. So this, this charge block comes with a little, it's like a magnetic, um, I guess piece that plugs into your controller. So I'm, I'm thinking about my PlayStation controller. It would plug into where you would charge it and it just kind of hangs off the bottom with little connectors, right? And it's magnetic. So when I go up to the block, I can just set my controller down and it automatically charges. It's literally like docking my controller and it just charges. Now, as if that wasn't cool enough, right? Just the fact of having a charger that you just put away in the dock and it's fine. This what Nyko has done is they have created this mechanism by which you can sort of link together these things. So let's say I have an Xbox controller and a PlayStation controller, and I want some centralized place to charge all of my controllers. Um, so last week I bought uh, two PlayStation controller chargers and one uh, Switch Pro controller charger, and now I have them in a line of three and they all plug into the same thing. They all dock together. And then within that, I can kind of dock my controllers on top. And I am just so jazzed about this for someone who loves, uh, like, charging stations. Yeah, now I kind of see you take a look at this, like, what you're talking about. It literally looks like, even from an Xbox perspective, too, you just literally slip this thing on top of the dock and away you go. It looks really simple. And it's not that expensive either. What you were describing, since it's like a charging station, I figured it'd be... Like, I don't know, somewhere up of like 50 bucks, but this is pretty reasonable. Well, no, this- yeah, and, and what is also nice, too, is that it's completely modular, right? If I if I need uh, another, like, if I get, uh, like, let's say I get another Pro Controller for my Wii or something, I can buy another one of these chargers and just dock it in on the thing. It does up to four, right? But And I think, ultimately, I will have two rows of these charging cables one for like my playstation vr stuff one for my nintendo switch stuff one for my um xbox stuff so maybe three of them i don't know but i'm so jazzed on it that i just want to buy more and more and more so i have one sort of centralized charging station that all looks uniform to charge everything in i don't i don't know i'm getting super jazzed about it just thinking about it it's it's one of those like dorky nerdy things but i absolutely love it i don't know man it looks pretty cool, and yeah, I think you've turned me onto it now. Because uh, like uh, I was <laughs> when I was playing like Fortnite over the weekend, I found that my like controller just kept dying, and I was like, I need to just go ahead and suck it up and get something rechargeable. And this looks like an awesome option because it's modular, like you said. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I just found out they have a PlayStation VR option too, so I'm definitely grabbing that one. All right, so okay, <laughs> what is it? We are what are we doing? There's a couple events coming up, man. It's a Monday night, man. I don't know what's going on. It, there's a couple events coming up. We got AHFE next month, uh, about a month from now, as it'll be ending. Got HFES International in uh, Philadelphia. That's uh, October, and then uh, we got HFES Australia in November, and we will have coverage of those events for you guys. We like to say them every week on the show to make sure you guys know what's going on and in case any of our listeners are brand new to the show we like to make sure you know uh, what's happening okay so why don't we get into the news let's let's do that thing let's drop the let's drop the news sounder and this is the part of the show all about the human factors news it's where we talk about everything uh wait what did you what you just type something in chat now i'm getting distracted it's okay we talk about everything related to the field of human factors this could be related to human factors medical transportation psychology whatever it is as long as it relates to the field it is fair game blake what do we got up first this week uh this week we are first doing our favorite thing talking about mastering reality in this case augmented reality but uh leap motion is always looking to advance their interactions in ways that push the limits of their hardware and software. And augmented reality is yet another area that Leap Motion is pushing its limits in an attempt to create more compelling platform experiences when it comes to human-computer interaction. So with their new demo, they use the Leap Motion hand tracking combined with a handheld paddle controller to show off their North Star headset. Uh, the vir- to give you an example of what this feels like, the virtual ball would soar back and forth and Bounce on a real table. And of course, there's some AI that's being used to power your component that's challenging you. And while augmented reality tennis tables are a lot of fun, it also demonstrates a key concept that's largely unexplored in mixed reality right now. 
artificial skills training for real world scenarios. So in VR, we can shape the experience to optimize learning, the task or behavior. And AR helps to elevate this potential with familiar real world environments, allowing us to contextualize these learned skills. So by overlaying virtual indicators and heuristics onto the user's view, Leap Motion is able to help them develop a deeper intuition of what's going on in the, what's going on in a given system or scenario. So eventually, as AR systems become more advanced and lifelike, current and near future professions may be aided by advanced AR training systems that allow us to casually achieve levels of skill that previously required months of determined practice. And Nick, this is something I've kind of come across a few different times, especially like with the combination of maybe learning something in AR or VR and then translating into more of a real world context with AR it added to it. Um, and it's something I want to... S- I would really like to see more of because I feel like uh, I've I've seen it talked about a lot in the boxing realm using as like kind of a training aid, uh, both to like gain skills within kind of the VR headset um, arena and then also taking it to an AR type context. Uh, but this is a, this is a great pull and Leap Motion is definitely pushing its limits uh, to try and you know break through with this headset of theirs. Yeah, I think this is really interesting on a variety of different levels because if you think about it, this is that missing step for uh well if you're unf- well let me back up one more step if you're unfamiliar what leap motion does they basically are all about this augmented reality in which you can uh use your hands to manipulate the virtual components in that augmented space um and so in this example they are uh learning to play table tennis where you know they are actually pinching the ball in their hands the virtual ball in their hands they're um they're throwing it in the air and then they are serving it with their right hand. They're holding a paddle apparatus. Now all that together isn't terribly impressive, but what is impressive is the fact that now um, because of leap motions technology, you are holding a virtual ball and you are, hello, I'm home. (laughs) You are holding a virtual ball and um, basically you are, you are uh, mimicking the, sort of motions that you would make on a table tennis uh, set. I don't know what you call them, table tennis court, where you throw the ball up in the air, right, with your hand. It's a virtual ball, but it follows the trajectory that your hand is creating. And so the whole point of this is that you are learning to do physical skills in an augmented or virtual environment. And, you know, they're saying that potentially this could be used in training situations where... um, You know, there is some sort of physicality or or learned physical component to a skill and transfer that over. Which I think table tennis is a great kind of use case for that, right? Because there's a lot of like hand-eye coordination going on and also differences in how you move and hold the paddle and then the competitive aspect too, right? But I'm sure there's a lot of kind of wide-ranging applications for anything that's very kind of motor-based, uh, to give you, and it help, I would imagine a lot of what it's doing is helping you develop some of that muscle memory for how to react quickly to different kind of stimuli. Yeah, I so the, yeah, there's there's a bunch of different applications for this, and um, I kind of like where. So we pulled this from the Leap Motion blog. I kind of like where this uh, this author, whoever wrote this, I'm not sure. It's just on the Leap Motion blog. Um, Oh, Jonathan Selstad. This is this is an article by him on the Leap Motion blog. They, uh, they he ends the article with, uh, though the age of swords and their utility has long since relegated been relegated to the distant past. It is my belief that the greatest swordsman of all time has not yet been born. Um, and so that's kind of that's kind of interesting to think about, right? You could learn how to sword fight in in this type of um, mixed reality space, right? With with potentially virtual opponents that you can. Uh, uh, you know, fight against, I don't know. I, this just screams lightsaber to me. And so of course my nerd side is like on fire over here. Well, that's, it's kind of funny because the other day in the office, we were talking a little bit about martial arts as well. And you had said you had kind of always been a little bit interested in some of the martial arts that have to do with more like weapon base yes. kind of stuff. So, I mean, this would be a, a great opportunity to be able to build some of that like skilled knowledge prior to like, you know, either stepping into it or seeing if you like it, something like that, or, getting you to a point where you would be bringing something to class 
Uh, and I, I think a lot of these kind of systems really could help with anything that's physical based like that, like even being able to practice certain, you know, it, t- it takes a little bit more in terms of like the stimulus you would need. And it would probably require like a haptic suit, but something like jujitsu and Muay Thai, like practicing before you go to class so that you've already built some of built some of hopefully like really good muscle memory for the kind of moves you would be doing and things like that. But I feel like this is another kind of application you could see this used for yeah to down me, the road of course to me this is kind of uh one step removed from uh wow i know kung, i know kung fu you know <laughs> like it's one step removed from that where you still have to train to get it but all the information that you need to practice is built right into this device potentially right you could download modules that teach you how to do x y and z um or even you know even I'm thinking about sort of the practical application. Like, let's say, let's say I'm working on my motorcycle, and I have a very, I, I have a specific motorcycle that I want to work on, like a 2007 Yamaha V Star, um, and you know, it has it has a specific engine, and and there's a bunch of different parts on it, right? And so, what if I uh, sort of wore these things, and while it wouldn't build muscle memory, but it could sort of overlay instructions on it, um, and teach me how to interact with the engine and do different things um you know it's a little bit different from what we're talking about here but i can still see that type of application right oh definitely yeah i mean that kind of thing would be awesome right or even doing kind of like uh, some of the more home improvement stuff in your own house like i don't know fixing fixing pump plumbing pipes or anything like that i mean being able to instead of having to go like watch something on youtube remember all the steps and then go complete it whether it's like messing with the engine in your car or replacing stuff in your sink i mean this way it's almost like you're you're watching yourself do it and maybe getting some visual cues through ar of like oh okay we'll do this but don't do that type of thing right i'm trying to apply this to like muscle memory stuff Right. So I'm thinking about like, what if there's like a sanding technique uh, for for woodworking that that is very specific to how you sand something down? Right. Like um, you could potentially sand something down in a virtual environment and learn that skill before you actually, you know, uh, destroy wood that you would have otherwise used on whatever you're building. And I can think of applications like that as well for crafts too. Like let's say there's a technique that you need to do on a painting on an easel. Um, and you don't quite know how to do that, that level of finesse. But if you practice with something, a device like this, it could potentially accelerate your ability to do those things. Yeah. It's, it's still crazy to me that, that we're like, uh, not only are we talking about like AR and VR, but now we're talking about the transfer of skills from one environment that's completely artificial that we're building on our own into potentially the real world. And it's, uh, I guess, I guess because it's still like, it's not a new concept, but it's something that I like, I haven't had a lot of experience with either one. And the fact that over time, I'm sure is like my career progresses, you'll start seeing these kind of things being put in the office place or anything like that. I mean, you've even talked about yourself using a HoloLens in the office, which is different from this, but still using these kind of like more advanced technologies to just enhance your overall life, whether it's just learning, um, learn these very what are we talking about here learning these various muscle memory actions and kind of like gaining that expertise quickly or just like having your calendar on the wall so you can always see it yeah okay well why don't we get into the next story here all right so keeping track of your blood sugar is poised to become a lot easier for some diabetics living in the u.s and last thursday the food and drug administration approved ever since continuous glucose monitoring system cgm system so the ever since is not the first approved cgm or continuous glucose monitoring system though it's the first with a fully implantable sensor according to the agency it's also it's also the Longest lasting by far, being able to be used for 90 days at a time compared to a previous system that needs to be replaced every 7 to 14 days. The Eversense uses a small pill-shaped sensor that's implanted under the skin by a doctor in a procedure that takes around 5 minutes. The sensor is coated with a fluorescent chemical that responds to glucose, allowing the sensor to measure someone's glucose levels in real time. And a wireless rechargeable transmitter affixed to the skin on top of the implant through adhesive through an adhesive, both powers the implant and allows it to send signals to a mobile app. So every five minutes, it sends measurements to the app, which alerts the users if their blood sugar is too low or too high. And the sensor also has vibration alarms that can go off in case somebody's mobile device is out of range. And Nick, these are the kind of 
advancements in technology that I think are amazing that you're being able to, you know, basically implant little pieces of software and hardware into somebody's skin and that can get real readable measures from their body to their cell phone. I mean, I think that's just nuts. Yeah, I'm excited because like like uh, the article says, this is the first implantable sensor. Uh, and it just goes to show that, you know, we are seeing these advances in um, the the healthcare human factor side of things, uh, you know, and and if you're if you're new to the show and haven't heard our healthcare human factor symposium uh, bonus episodes, go check those out because we talk about a lot of really interesting uh, medical stories. Uh, but but I can I can see this being very beneficial to a lot of people who are diabetic potentially, you know, where instead of now um, having to do things the traditional way. You have sort of this self-monitoring system because of this sis- this sensor, and uh, yeah, it's good news all around. I don't know what else to say. Like this is, I pulled this story because it's awesome, but at the same time, like, I, great. What's the next step? <laughs> yeah, this is kind of a a cool one for me because I, although this is definitely geared towards people with diabetes who are constantly monitoring their glucose levels, it has benefits for like somebody like me who wants to know how different different foods that I'm eating or is affecting my blood glucose level, whether it's like spiking really high or if it's something a little bit more moderate, uh, because that helps. I don't know. It helps you tune your diet to be careful about like how often you're spiking your glucose way too high or if there's certain foods that affect you a certain way. Uh, But at the same time, it's also nice to see these these more implantable systems because it's it's great to be able to continuously monitor something, whether it's glucose or any kind of other hormone levels or even like just getting blood measurements more on a regular basis without so much invasive treatment as to having to go to the doctor and get blood taken. I mean, in this case, it could, we have the opportunity to start measuring those kind of things um, just through one implant that might be able to do serve multiple functions. Now, this one's really only specifically for glucose monitoring, but I think it, it has a lot of implications for you know medical science as a whole because I know there's a big movement in the medical community to move away from just like kind of the snapshot view of seeing what's going on with a patient periodically when they come in when something's wrong to like trying to really measure through through things like your Fitbit and potentially something like this that's measuring you know more biomarkers that you can see on a daily basis and really start to develop and see trends or maybe even make predictions about what what might be happening with a specific patient before something goes wrong. Yeah, you bring up some great points there with the uh, longevity of the sensor and and being able to see trends over time rather than just sort of uh, these snapshot views. Um, You know, and that kind of goes back to when we were talking about the healthcare symposium stuff, we were there was this talk about how how to improve the process. And and, um, I I don't know. I don't remember what you attended, Blake. Uh, at the healthcare symposium, but I do I do remember that they there was a lot of talk about improving the process around um, FDA guidance and and sort of trying to um, you know tackle things from the manufacturer side, but also from the uh, the device desi- device design um, and product life cycle all the way up to the 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 hospitals and, and incorporating the technology in, in, um, in the, in the actual, wow, what am I trying to say? <laughs> the hospitals, but then also the patient, right? So there's, there's these three separate distinct areas in which design plays a role and all three of them kind of come together. And it sounds like, you know, we're, we're getting further along with sort of helping the process, especially if, you know, this is the first product where the FDA is approving this implanted sensor yeah no i definitely think you're right because now you're having to take into account not just like how does it interact with a patient and those kind of things but what's how long is it how long is it allowed to be on their body or in their body and how much time does that goes by and then how do you make sure that you're interfacing correctly with a doctor to get it taken out there's just a lot of different steps that have to be involved and like you were like you were saying i mean that was a big theme at the sim healthcare symposium this year is making sure that when we're talking about human factors of either whether it's like devices or processes you got to really think about who all is going to be touching this this system or be touched by this specific process and what does that look like over the life cycle of a product and in this case we've got something now that's being released it's kind of a a brand brand new concept in terms of how long it's being out there but now you've got to think about okay for 90 days somebody's going to wear this and it's going to be transmitting data back and forth to their phone but you have to make sure that 
that, okay, when it comes time for this thing to come out, um, are you, what's the best way to interface with your doctor or when you schedule appointments to get something like this put into your, into your skin, does it automatically, you know, go ahead and put that appointment in there for it to be taken out. There's just a lot of things that have to be taken into account um, with adding these kind of more complex technologies into the medical field. Hey, as long as we're talking about the medical field, I want to move on to our next story. But before we do, I want to thank all of our friends over at Leap Motion, the FDA, Gizmodo, and Brookings for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or join us on our Slack for links to the original articles. All right, Blake, why don't we get into more healthcare human factors? Yeah, this is one we haven't talked about in a long time. So this is dealing with a little more with prosthetics, something that we see a lot of stories about, but it's been a while. So pain definitely sucks, but without it, we'd be extremely lost because it's a definitely a valuable sensation for us to have. And currently, prosthetic limbs aren't really capable of transmitting these kinds of complex sensations sensations like texture or pain to somebody that's using them. But a recent breakthrough by scientists at John Hopkins School of Medicine in which a synthetic layer of skin on an artificial hand transmitted feelings of pain directly to a user takes us one step closer to that goal. So pain helps to protect our bodies from damage by giving us the sensation that something may be harmful, such as like a sharp edge of a knife. And for a prosthesis, there's no there's no real concept of pain, which leaves it open up open up to possibly being damaged or being hurt or not getting knocked out and any of these and scientists have really been working hard to find a way to provide sensations of pain in a meaningful way through prosthetics uh, that also help amputees and other users of prosthetic products understand that hey there might be something going on outside of my body that i can't normally feel but now i can and nick this is such an awesome application of both you know kind of like we talked about artificial limbs, but also really trying to transmit information to the brain about what's going on with that limb. Yeah, think about sort of the the human is the user of the prosthetic limb. And so when they don't get feedback about what's going on with the device that they are using, um, which, I mean, is prosthetics are an extension of your body uh, for, for amputees or, or um, people who don't have arms or legs or any piece of their body uh it is it's an extension right so and and like a lot of us can sort of uh i guess for for common folk think about using your phone right that for a lot of people that is an extension of your brain you keep information in it that you don't have to store in your brain um it for all intents and purposes is an extension of you and now if you take that and imagine not getting feedback from your phone. Like imagine not getting a call when somebody calls you or or uh, getting in a notification when somebody likes your post on Facebook or whatever it is, right? Except what if that information that didn't come through could potentially damage the thing that is an extension of you, right? That's what pain does. Pain uh, sort of um, it notifies you that there is something wrong, that that you should pull your hand away from the stove. And, you know, because if you're using a prosthetic, uh, you don't, you don't get that information. It doesn't translate. And so the way this thing works is there are sensors on the tips of the fingers, at least in this model. And, um, there is, uh, within the sensors on the tips, it sends a signal to the stimulator, uh, at, at the base of wherever it connects to the body. Um, so on the shoulder, at the elbow, wherever it is. And, um, I'm going to mess up this, this, uh, this nerve name, but it's transcutaneous. Is that, does that sound right? That sounds right to me, man. (laughs) So it, it stimulates the transcutaneous nerve and sends a signal of pain to the brain. And so now you get sort of this emulated sense of pain from the tips of, um, you are prosthetic. So now uh, you are basically passing through a sense that has not previously been there, which is, this is awesome, man. This is really cool. Yeah, because it's, it's interesting that it has such wide ranges of applications here because, I mean, if if it, part of the problem with prosthetics, right, is you don't have as much control over them, or that's something we've definitely gone through in the past, but we've even seen stories that were looking more into trying to make that, you know, brain body connection back with being able to, you know, like flex a prosthetic arm and things like that. So now this is taking that idea one step further, and it's now just not allowing you to, you know, interact with your own 
prosthetic arm or leg or whatever it may be, but it's also letting you to feel something, like feel in quotes, I guess, or stimulate, receive some kind of stimulation that is analogous to what you would feel um, normally, and so you can react to it. So I feel like it's it's we're gearing up towards being able to really provide a a more true to life experience through prosthetics, which is just kind of incredible if you think about like kind of where it started to where it is now. Yeah. And I'm so thinking about the design of some sort of system like this, it's kind of crazy, right? Cause you have to think about, well, I want to provide the user with a sense of pain, but I don't want it to be too distracting that they can't operate. Right. So, so how, how do you get the signal just right? How do you, um, how do you get that sensation of pain only when you're touching something that's painful, heat, sharp edges, those types of things, rather than just, uh, um, you know, holding something in your hand, like it's uh, like, like pressure or something else. Uh, so, so the design of all that behind the scenes is pretty cool too. Uh, and I encourage any of you who are uh, interested in this story to go check it out. It's on science robotics. I think we pulled this one from Gizmodo. Um, but, uh, the, the actual articles on, um, science for robotics, robotics, science, robotics, that's it. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting to kind of think about the design process and how you're, you're kind of designing pain in a way you're designing input stimuli that will have to agree with the external stimuli and be contextual enough to understand when you are indeed experiencing a painful stimulus. Yeah, because if you imagine like the amount, like the ranges or thresholds you'd have to think about to design for something like this, because I mean, we you gave the example earlier of kind of like not touching the hot stove, and I mean that would be that would be one level of kind of pain experience, right? But also too, if something is a little more dire, like if something's if something was to fall on your leg and it could crush it if you didn't move it, type of thing, or if you stubbed your toe, like there's just such a wide range of different kind of levels of pain you'd have to design for. And of course the, the reactions aren't necessarily going to be always the same, right? Because it's the danger level isn't always going to be exactly the same, but it's, um, it's a hard problem to design for, but at the same time, it was probably, it was probably really interesting to sit around and kind of think of, okay, how do we really design the thresholds for each one of these kind of like pain areas? And then what is, what's that sensation going to feel like to each person um, through this kind of like nerve stimulation process? Yeah, so so this is kind of related to robotics, but our last story kind of focuses on robotics. So why don't we go ahead and get into that? All right, let's go. So for decades, humans have dreamed of doing nothing while armies of robots do everything for them. Yet, as it turns out, now we now, turns out now idle daydreaming is slowly giving way to reality, and people are getting a little bit uncomfortable, according to a new survey of. 2021 adult internet users from Brookings Institution, the vast majority of people just aren't all that excited about having a robot help them out around the house. Just 20% of people said that they were interested in obtaining a cleaning robot, while 68% said they were not. For more sensitive tasks like security or caring for a child or an aging relative, the numbers were even lower. So 17% said they were interested in having a guard robot, 67% uninterested, and 9% expressed interest in having a robotic caretaker. So in the reverse of that would be 87% of people were uninterested in a robotic caretaker. So automation is already displacing human labor at a concerning rate, and particularly sectors like manufacturing or the long list or of myriad jobs that can be replaced with computers, everything from medical record technicians to loan officers. But when it comes to the home, most people seem to be seem fine doing their own dishes for now. Now this is, this is kind of a, a interesting survey that they did here. Cause it's, it's almost a reverse of what you, what I would have thought would have been true. I mean, I, I would think people would want more, if they're able to get more kind of robotic aids, whether it's in the home or even kind of in more, um, you know, like in the medical setting or even in, secu- in security settings. We've, we've seen some some kind of cop robots rolling around in some of right. the other stories we've talked about. But it, it definitely seems like there people are much less interested in that. And I wonder if that's kind of a product of people losing a lot of jobs to automation, more so of like kind of a dislike or fear might not be the right word, but I'll use it of robotics. Yeah, so this is this is interesting, right? So I I, I 
for one, think that, you know, p- public perception of automation is on a downtick where, you know, this, to to be clear, this, this survey was done between June 4th and June 6th, so just earlier this month. Um, pretty fresh. Pretty fresh, right? But this follows in the wake of, uh, you know, the, the fatal Uber crash in, in Tempe. It follows in the wake of... Um, all these sort of automated system failures. Um, and I, I just think that there's a lot of sort of uh, negative public perception around robotics and uh, and automated systems right now. I, I feel like overall, we if you, if you were to, if this was a um, longitudinal study, I feel like you'd probably see some sort of uptick from five years ago even. But, yeah, I don't know. It's it, I, I I just feel like the public perception right now is is uh is is pretty low because of everything that's happening in the media. Yeah, and I, I think you're right, especially especially given that this was only done a couple of weeks ago, and it's pretty high negative negative kind of connotation centering around it, or not net really negative connotation, but at least like people are not super excited about any of these options that are given out, um, and. I, I don't know. I think it probably has a lot to do as well in, in kind of addition to this, because I feel like I'm hearing this on a lot of podcasts or seeing it across articles is this major concern of how many jobs are going to be lost to automation. And it, se- it seems like the AI and automation or robots, they, they kind of go hand in hand on a lot of people's minds. Um, so I could I could see this be that being like a contributing factor. Um, but it, and I think we'll see it would be interesting to kind of do this. I don't know, every other month for the next year or two and see what changes. Cause I, I feel like we're going to see more improvements over, especially over the next six to six to 12 months in automation where we're talking about vehicles. Um, and I, and I think as long as, as long as we see like a decreasing, you know, accident rate or whatnot, we, we should kind of see a different kind of spin in public perception, but who knows? I mean, it may, it may stay steady, uh, just depending, depending on how people really, really view the introduction of automation into their own lives. Yeah. So take this or leave it. But one of the, uh, <laughs> one of the stats here is that there are 68% of people who are not interested, who took the survey, who are not interested in a robot to, uh, clean the home and, you know, looking at iRobot stock who specializes in Roomba, um, you know their stock is down over the last year, so maybe that's telling. I don't know. Uh, I, I honestly don't know what is causing this trend, other than all these high-profile cases. Um, and it's kind of interesting with something like iRobot or like the the people that make Roomba, right? Because that's that's something that's been around for a very long time. Longish, yeah. I mean, they're they're probably one of the they were one of the first ones on the market for sure for the the clean home robots. Yeah, so those kind of like service style robots, I I would feel like people would have an easier time with that, um, but I get obvi- I guess not. I mean, I, according to this specific survey, anyhow. Yeah, I mean it's interesting, right? Because because that's the highest percent of people who are interested in, and it seems like that's, um, I don't know, because if you're looking at this survey, I'm looking at uh, the like third or fourth figure down. You see where I'm talking about here? The the overall not interested and interested clean home provide security and care for a child or aging relative. This one's yeah. really interesting to me because as you get further closer to taking care of a human, um, you know, you are it, people are less and less um, interested in that sort of capability. But I'm wondering. So so this is limited to robotics, but I'm wondering, you know, it, did they take into account automation? for this at all because if you think about it robots or automation is a digital robot in a sense right and and so so maybe you know there's there's definitely automated systems in hospitals now that are taking care of people keeping them on life support etc yeah that's a good question nick i mean what was the operational definition here when we say like robotics or automation and how does that all play in together i mean just based on the way that they kind of present this article on um from brookings it it seems to me like they're talking more about physical you know, the walking around physical robot exactly yeah yeah but but in it's kind of strange to me in places that 
or in places like uh, like in a hospital or even like caretaking, obviously maybe not being the sole caretaker, but I would have expected kind of a more uh, a bigger increase in people thinking that that would be something they would want. Um, and maybe it's because we don't have a, a great proof of concept of that. And so it's still a little bit it's a little bit like kind of a serious unknown territory. But I, I don't know. I kind of agree with you along the lines of there's there's different automation sets that are going into like how people are taking care of at hospitals or stuff like that. So I, I don't really know what the hesitation is. Yeah, I don't. I, so I'm looking at the survey questions here, right? And they just kind of leave it at robot. I don't know if they operationally defined it in the actual study, in the actual survey. But the question is as follows. How interested are you in having a robot that helps clean your home? And, you know, they just say robot. They don't they don't specify what that means. Does that mean uh, uh, some form of automation? Does that mean a physical robot that is in your place doing stuff? And I think maybe that perception is skewing it in one way or the other um because especially when you consider automated systems um you know i would i would expect this to be a lot higher because we have it's so ubiquitous in our life now i mean there was a study a while ago about how many people have uh uh uh, one of those devices that i'm not going to say the name of because she'll turn on the lights you know what i mean ah yes how many how many people have that in their home that's true. Uh, so, it, I, I don't know. One thing I do want to mention, just, and this is just me kind of looking at the questions and picking up on maybe what could be going on here, is maybe it's just not that well-defined what robot means for the majority of people. Because this, this yeah. is like 2,000 people on the internet, right? And I don't know I don't know how representative that is, but a lot of, a lot of the, these questions still have a high percentage of like 20 or more that say, I really just don't know the answer. Um, so are you worried about robots uh, over the next five years? Do you expect that they will make an impact in your life? It's, I feel like there's a component of this that people just don't really know what's going on in robotics. Uh, and my, myself included, I feel like I'm much more clued into what's going on in automation and AI than I am in the world of robotics right now. So I feel like I may have answered some of these questions in a similar fashion. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's interesting to think about, but, uh, all right, well, are we done? <laughs> Are, are we done? Do you have any other closing thoughts? I don't want to sound like I'm excited to be done, but uh... he's just he's just too stoked to beat the band, kids. No, I think uh, I think we tackle that one pretty well. It's a uh, it's an interesting study. I'd, I'm going to read some more of the questions and see how I feel about it. Yeah, me too. Well, like I said, guys, it's going to be a shorter episode tonight. We got some stuff to take care of behind the scenes, but don't worry, we'll be back next week for it came from Reddit. But that's going to be it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. Uh, if you're a Patreon supporter, be sure to stay tuned for. Human Factors Cast Infinite. We'll be launching that sometime soon. For the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. Drop us a comment on our SoundCloud. Send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 901 646 1432. That's 901 646 1 HFC. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, whatever your favorite podcast directory is. If you want to join the after show party, you can support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash human factors cast. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, human factors cast.com. I want to thank my favorite co-host for being here on the show today. Blake Arnsdorf, where can our listeners find you if they want to talk about your opinions on in-home robots? <laughs> you can always find me across social media. Don't panic UX. And hopefully Nick does replace me with a robot. I will not replace Mr. Blake Arnsdorf with a robot. <laughs> As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. And remember, till next time, it depends. Depends. It depends. On the type of robot you're replaced with. Robots. Robots. Robots.